how do you pin a city to a page? How do you write about uh, a unit which is constantly evolving and is, in a sense, sort of untamable uh, in writing? If you were writing a travel narrative, it's a very straightforward narrative structure that you inherit. You start at the beginning of a journey and you write, and, and the journey provides the narrative. But there are many, many different ways of capturing a city. Two of us here have chosen, in a sense, a narrative method of, of, of a story of our relationship with the city. Um, one, an expatriate coming back to a city that was uh, a family home but was not familiar. In my own case, uh, a city which I'd adopted and, and have lived in since the age of 18. Sam chose a completely characteristically eccentric method all of his own of sort of spiraling out, spiraling out of the city uh, like an ammonite. Uh, and Pilar chose a more academic approach uh, and reached the city through its maps. Um, a completely different approach. So we have today two very different cities which oddly have strange commonalities. Both Delhi and Calcutta at different times in their history like to think of themselves as the epitome of high culture. Both are slightly fallen on hard times culturally. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the high Urdu and the adab of the Mughal court uh, or the intense literary culture uh, of the uh, Bengali Badralok are, are both are, uh, in a sense, um, uh, animals uh, heading for possible extinction uh, and under the wave of the new India. Um, but uh, I think the best way is if we all um, talk for about five, six, seven minutes uh, with a reading from our respective books, and then we'll uh, try and uh, converge into a discussion comparing the two cities. Probably the easiest way is just to take it left to right. Sam, do you want to open with your book? Certainly. Um, I first came to India in the late 80s, and the first cities I knew well were Bombay and Calcutta. Uh, and I came to Calcutta to do a radio documentary for the BBC uh, for the Tercentenary, and I loved it. Um, and then I moved to Delhi sometime after that, and I hated Delhi. I thought it was parochial and mean-spirited and just the most mutlabi city of any in, in this wonderful country. Um, I then returned, I left, after having loved being everywhere else apart from Delhi, uh, I returned in 2003 and began to walk its streets in a way that I hadn't done before and began to see a Delhi that I hadn't known, that had been invisible to me Though it was also a Delhi that had changed a great deal and was changing very rapidly in front of my eyes. And over a few years, I began to explore more and more of the city and write about the city in a way that made me pay it more respect, uh, love it some of the time, hate it some of the time, uh, and very quickly move between the two. Uh, th this book which came out now nine years ago, was the result of that. Um, I'm going to read a bit from it um, that I don't think I've read before, but I want to read it partly because it's about, really, the future of Delhi and actually the future of cities, and that could include um, Calcutta as well, a lot of the kind of lessons that we all need to learn uh, I think, apply to, to all of these cities. Can you hear me okay at the back? Is that okay? Yeah. The year 1999 was one of the worst in Delhi's history. Air pollution reached record levels. There were daily power cuts and water shortages. Rioters took to the streets. A tornado struck the south of the city. There were huge fires in the largest industrial area. A plague of locusts descended on Delhi's suburbs. Space junk landed in the city center. 
and the Yamuna turned into a raging whirlpool. The population halved in the course of the year with people fleeing to the neighboring countryside and the city went bankrupt. Delhi's long-standing mayor, Sham Mitra, leaned back, stared at his computer screen and felt he had no option but to resign. Or he could go back to his previous saved version of Sim City, where Delhi was still a flourishing metropolis. Until my son introduced me to Sim City, I thought all computer games were about killing or winning or both. In Sim City, you can't win and no one ever dies. Instead, you build your own simulated city, call it what you want, become its mayor, and see how successful you are at running it. People, known as Sims, migrate to your city when it's an attractive place to live and work in, and they leave it if they don't like it. I became a secret addict. addict. It's unexpectedly realistic, and because there is a serious side to it, like a beginner's course in urban planning, I felt able to pretend that I was hard at work. Sim City has a number of pre-installed cities, real and invented, including London, Los Angeles, and an all too plausible Dullsville. But there's not a single city from the developing world, so no Delhi. So I had to create a virtual Delhi. You do it with a, a, a mouse and toolbar, and I built a, an image of this city that I was living in. I hurriedly created Old Delhi first with a central street just like Chandni Chowk as its main east-west aspect. By the time it, it, I'd reached 1920, I began building British New Delhi. The avenues of India's new capital were laid out according to the plans of Lutyens and Baker. I moved on quickly to the concentric circles of Connaught Place the city's population continued to grow slowly. I soon came across the disaster menu, a drop-down list which allowed me to summon up a wide range of catastrophes. And so, at the click of a mouse, I was able to replicate the great North Delhi tornado of 1978, the partition riots of 47, the anti-Sikh riots of 84, the anti-Muslim riots of 1992. They all took place on the streets of Sim Delhi. However, the Sim City computer model was not working like the real Delhi in a number of telling ways. Sims are a lot more fussy or spoilt than the people of Delhi. By the late 1990s, my city only had a population of just over half a million, a twentieth of the size of the real Delhi. If the roads aren't kept in perfect condition, or there are a few power cuts, Sims leave the cities in, city in droves. Sims simply won't move into a house without an underground 24-hour water supply. As mayor of Delhi, I became more and more frustrated and began to run out of money. Most of the city's income came from taxes, and its residents kept moving out if I raised tax rates. In early 1999, an old electricity generating station became overloaded and blew up. I didn't have enough money to buy a new one, and all the other electricity plants tripped. Suddenly, Delhi had no power, and my lovingly created city had no water either. In the real Delhi, poor people would have used hand pumps and wells. The rich would have used water tankers and generators but Sim Delhi just collapsed. A self-destructive anger born of imp impotence overtook me. I pressed every disaster button and went to get a beer from the fridge. My city by now was black with the carcasses of deserted buildings by the time I returned a few minutes later. In two Sim City years, the population had returned to almost nothing. I realized that I hadn't destroyed the city quite as quickly as the British had following the 1857 uprising or as Mohammed Tughlaq had done in 1327, but I had come pretty close. Delhi was dead. 
I searched out my son and told him my tale of woe, and he told me a secret. He taught me about cheat codes. Most computer games have them, he told me with a slightly patronizing air, as if I were the child. With SimCity, you just need to type in the special code and everything is free. He reverted to my old stored version of Sim Delhi from 1993, held down four keys at once, and up jumped a little dialog box. He typed, I am weak, and suddenly I had unlimited money. Everything was free. Another cheat code, nerd's rule, converted all my old industrial buildings into high-tech ICT businesses. I began to create the perfect Delhi, my version of Amir Khusro's Heaven on Earth. Like Delhi's city planners of the 1960s and 1970s, I was able to ignore reality. They just pretended it was a middle-sized city without major infrastructure problems. I could just print money and buy any solution I wanted. I did still try to keep the city authentic, so the metro appeared in 2002, and an earthquake shook the city in 2005. Lots of sporting facilities sprang up across the city in time for the Commonwealth Games of 2010, by which time the metro had spread across all of Delhi. There were still more sports stadia for the 2028 Olympics, and I was delighted when my city became an international hub for space travel in 2045. As the population continued to grow, I felt pleased with myself, despite the double artificiality of a city which exists only on a computer hard drive and in which construction costs are zero but it did raise the same issues which remain at the heart of Delhi's modern dilemma. I had chosen population growth as my indicator of success, recognizing that improved services means more migrants, which puts greater pressure on services. If these services can be improved, the city's population would spiral. Delhi has a limited number of pixels or land squares on which I can grow my city. And in the end, I ran out of space with a population of just over two million. There are no geographical limits, no mountains and no coastline to the expansion of the real Delhi. It could, for better or worse, continue to grow in every direction. And it may, once again, become the most populous city in the world. Thank you. use the mic. Yeah. Is that good? Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Um, my name is Kushanava Chaudhary. I uh, lived in Calcutta till I was 12. Then my family moved to the U.S. Uh, and went, I went to high school and college in the U.S. And then when I was 22, I moved back to, this, to Calcutta to work as a newspaper reporter at an English daily called The Statesman, which at the time was the largest paper uh, in Calcutta. And then uh, I worked there for two years uh, while the paper slowly kind of declined uh, into a kind of oblivion. And uh, it's, still, it's still around. The people have, it's like an endangered species. It's hard to find. Uh, but uh, I went back to the US. I went to graduate school. But no matter what I did or where I went, I felt like my real life was happening in Calcutta. And I was just kind of wandering around in some kind of semi-retirement in my mid-20s. And so I kept coming back, and I had this idea that I would come back, figure out some way to come back, uh, and, uh, and perhaps write a book about the city. And this is a section where um, I'm on a trip back to Calcutta, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was a graduate student with me uh, at Yale, um, is also on that trip, and we're sort of in Calcutta together. Right? It's called Umbrella Park. I want to read this section because actually, I, uh, this is my first time at, at JLF, and uh, the number of young people that are here just warms my heart, you know, and I just feel like our cities are such cons conspiracies against the desires of, of young people, um, and uh, which is why I thought this would be an appropriate section. Umbrella Park. One of my first memories of Durba is of seeing her in a coffee shop in New Haven 
curled up in a big armchair reading a novel. We had met as PhD students at Yale and become friends. She was studying anthropology while I studied political theory. Among our closest friends were Colombians, South Africans, Turks, and Spaniards. Durba had grown up in Delhi, her father was Bengali, and his side of the family all lived in Calcutta. Yet when we eventually became a couple in the cosmopolitan cocoon of graduate school, our common background seemed almost incidental. In the fall of our fourth year of graduate school, Durba went to India to do a year of field research for her dissertation on how globalization was changing the Bengal countryside. That winter, she was living with her grandparents in Calcutta, so I planned a visit to the city. Her grandparents did not know of our relationship. So after months apart, we reunited in Calcutta on a street corner. She was wearing a fitted t-shirt and tight jeans. I watched her as she came up the sidewalk to where I was standing. Any public display of affection or even holding hands was socially taboo. So we just stood there, looking at each other lustfully. In Calcutta, Durba and I felt like actors who had wandered off the set of an indie romantic comedy and onto an instructional video shoot for the Taliban. In the few zones where romance was allowed, guards were always on the prowl to offset any hints of excessive public displays of affection. Sitting and touching are forbidden here, a guard barked at me uh, at a shopping arcade that seemed to exist precisely so that couples could sit in pairs and whisper sweet nothings to each other. In most places, a kiss or a caress could get you booked for indecency, or more commonly could be used as a pretext to extort a bribe. Instead, in designated areas like Rawindra Shodun, you could sit two by two on benches with your arms around each other, feeling lustfully constipated. One day, we were passing by what looked like an ordinary city park, except it had a ticket counter at the gate. What's inside the park? I asked the ticket seller, wondering why we were being charged, he was charging admission. Inside, he said, with a meaningful smile, is a park. We paid and strolled in. Sure enough, there were trees, shrubs, trails, a lake. It was a hot afternoon, and initially, we seemed to be the only ones there. Then, everywhere we looked, we noticed umbrellas. They were resting against the boundary wall, among the shrubs, along the lakeside, all opened up like shields. Occasionally, a man would stand up from behind one such shield, zipping up his pants, followed up by a woman. Durba looked at me amazed. My uncle comes here for his morning constitutional. <laughs> In fact, by late afternoon, we spotted a few old timers at the park benches. Some were even pretending to read the newspaper. Probably they had all, probably their families were all entirely unaware of their voyeuristic per perambulations in what we took to calling Umbrella Park. Umbrella Park typified what we felt was Calcutta's conspiracy against romance. Sex outside marriage in any form still remains unseen and is unspeakable in the drawing rooms of the Bhadralok, the city's dominant Bengali middle class. If you're an unmarried couple, no one will even rent you a house. Group sex, hooker sex, and premarital sex are all more or less equivalent and all consigned to the netherworld of illicit activity. Just as most men smoke cigarettes, but just not in front of their elders, lovers are free to do as they like, so long as they keep it out of sight. Prop open an umbrella in the middle of a public park, and well, anything goes. Or hire a boat on the Ganga, which comes with a bed and a boatman and can be booked by the hour. Or slip into one of the city's old restaurants which still have family cabins, boots which can be closed off with a drawn curtain. Like lovers the world over who are desperate with longing, most couples in Calcutta seek recourse in hourly hotels. There, an, a young unmarried couple is on the same footing with a boss and a secretary or a prostitute and her john. When police raid such places, all are equally vulnerable because none are married. The great Indian family remains the organizing principle of modern Bengali society. It stands on two pillars, get married, have a child. The get married, have a child formula is applied as widely as penicillin. Depressed, unemployed, gay, get married, have a child. <laughs> Once you've taken steps one and two, society will absorb you as a recognizable unit and extend its myriad protections. 
No matter the situation, a marriage, of course, can always be arranged between strangers with the express objective of making babies. But defy the social structure, and you may find yourself with your pants down in Umbrella Park. <laughs> in New Haven, monogamy, not marriage, was a defining norm. For Durba and I, the lack of a marriage certificate had had little bearing on our shared life. In Calcutta, it made all the difference. Hello, is this working? Yeah, okay. Hi everyone, uh, nice to see all of you here. And uh, I'm Pilar, I sort of uh, came here very, I think not very long time ago. I came here seven years ago only. And was my first, uh, my first time in India was actually seven years ago. I'm trained as an architect. I was trained in Politecnico di Milano in Milan. And I didn't know anything about India at that time. I sort of studied, I did my PhD on Delhi. Uh, and uh, I sort of lived here for the past. I lived in Delhi teaching like four years during my PhD and then the last three years teaching in Delhi. But the story is quite funny. I so Politecnico di Milano is very famous as a university because it's sort of uh, very interested in the relationship between tradition and contemporary. So it's always trying to um, um, inform contemporary architecture through history. So that is sort of the most important aspect of the school. So when I finished architecture, I thought, how interesting would it be to work on a city, on, on um, a country where it's actually developing and has a lot of history. So sort of exploring maybe South America, maybe Africa, maybe China. And actually, I ended up thinking that India was the most interesting one. I didn't know anyone in India. So I start asking around to some historian that I knew that maybe if they know somebody who's sort of good at this topic, and they give me an email just an email. They said, okay, you can try your luck. You can send an email to this person. Maybe everything will go through. I was very skeptical. I dropped an email to this professor who's A.G. Krishnaman, and I mean, he's a quite renowned architect. And I was like, I'm a student of architecture. I've never been to India. I really am interested in analyzing probably the city of Delhi. I want to discuss with you. Can you please meet me? Very skeptical answer. He said, okay, I'm coming to Heidelberg if you want to come. It took me five days begging him, saying that I'm very serious, I want to come. Okay, but if you come, you don't have to be like the usual foreigner who come here, pick some stuff, then go back and do not sort of live in my country. He said, okay, I'm committed. And I traveled my first time 2011. I came here, and then since then, I've sort of lived with him in his family. I never left, and sort of my journey started. So in terms of interest, um, we sort of start discussing and the topic that I was fascinated by and the topic for which the two books that I've written, one is Maps of Delhi, who came out in April, and the other one is this one, which is Negotiating Cultures, Delhi's Architecture and Planning from 1912 to 1962. So one book is about the maps of Delhi and how actually through maps you can sort of discover the development, how the city actually developed in a visual way. And this other one instead is the understanding of how cultures, different cultures and the exchange of cultures sort of transformed architecture and planning of Delhi pre and post independence, which I thought was very interesting moment to understand globalization nowadays. So a sort of historical perspective on a present sort of issue. I'm going to read a very short piece, which actually are the questions that I've asked myself before starting the PhD. And I think it's not just the questions that sort of are related just to Delhi, are questions that sort of, I think every architect or everyone who's sort of working in a contemporary city with this globalization should ask themselves. The interaction of different cultures profoundly modifies cities and their architecture, raises questions about the impact of globalization as a whole, and defines the very identity of different urban scapes. It alters the so-called tradition, the perception of historical events, and the way history is written. It raises questions about the architect's background, whether domestically or internationally educated, and the models of reference point that are to be adopted in any given design. 
to what degree are foreign imported models valid and how important it is to find them directly in loco? To what degree is education actually affected by the geographic location and the local culture? How should an architect confront or at least approach the different layers of cultural legacies? So actually these were the questions that I've asked myself. And just to give you the sort of answer, I, it's not an answer, but sort of conclusion I came to. Um, this, here, this one small little piece here. This research established and demonstrate, supported by the documents, that Delhi has played an active role in the complex process of hybridization in both pre- and post-independence periods, developing its own character as opposed to merely accepting what was brought from abroad. Both periods have been characterized by resilient and continuing compromise between indigenous and foreign elements, and thus the post-1947 period cannot be construed as more indigenous than the previous one. This is actually the research I've, I've sort of done, and nowadays I'm continuing this research on the contemporary, I mean, on what is actually, how globalization has sort of interacted with new cultures and all of that. I've written a few books on Delhi now. This is the first, which I wrote in my early 20s. It's a book called City of Gins. Um, it's a city I first came to at the age of 18 on my year off, and I'm still there, with the, still living the, the longest year off in history, I think, <laughs> now in my 50s. Um, what intrigued me about Delhi was that, like Calcutta, it was a city which once had this reputation for extreme high culture. The Urdu of Shah Jahanabad was the model for good language in the way that Tuscan Italian is the model for perfect Italian, Dante's Italian. Uh, Mughal etiquette, the adab of the Mughal court, became the model for courts around the country, Rajasthan, Lucknow, Hyderabad. And yet today, Delhi was like was, you know, this old dowager, the city of enormous uh, grandeur and elegance, was behaving like a Nivarish heiress, all public display and gold bathrooms and uh, marble everywhere, uh, and a far from cultured city in many ways, a Punjabi city full of musty and excitement, but uh, not a place renowned today for elegance in any way. Um, and I began to realize quite how much of Delhi's modern identity boiled down to the whole horror of partition, which in Delhi led to the emigration of the entire Muslim elite that had dominated the city's culture for, since the 12th century and had re been replaced by the Punjabi refugees who got kicked out of Lahore and the Punjab arrived in, in streams of refugees on bullet carts and in, in trains. Uh, many of them, many trains obviously, full of dead bodies, all those stories. And that trauma seemed to have affected so much of the city and, and, and the violence and the uh, aggression that many people from the south of the country, for example, feel when they arrive in its streets. And I realized that if I really wanted to understand Delhi, I actually had to go somewhere else. I had to go to Karachi, uh, which was a, a city uh, which had taken in so much of the elite that had disappeared from Delhi. And in areas of Karachi, like Burns Roads, whole streets of Delhi had reassembled themselves post-1947. So the, the famous kebab sellers on the steps of the, of the Jama Masjid, the different food stalls that people used to know in that area, were now located in Burns Road in Karachi. Also in Karachi lay the man who to me, had taught more about the old city pre-47 than anyone else. And, and still, I think, today, um, maybe despite Arundhati Roy's extraordinary new novel, still the great Delhi novel, Twilight in Delhi, written by Ahmed Ali. And Ahmed Ali writes one of the most passionate love letters to a city that I know. Twilight in Delhi is a gorgeous book. If you do anything today, go out and find a copy. It's the most wonderful, wonderful study uh, of the city of Delhi. But he had left in 47, and I couldn't understand why anyone who'd 
loved the city so much, would choose to leave. So I went and found him. David Davidar, who was then running Penguin, uh, located uh, uh, an address for him. I wrote to him and he invited me to come and see him. So in, uh, what, I suppose 1990, 1991, I caught a flight to Karachi uh, and went to meet the, the great chronicler of Delhi, who to my surprise was still alive, still passionate. And this is what he told me. Ahmed Ali was there to meet us. He wore severe black rimmed glasses, above which sprouted a pair of thin gray eyebrows. He slurred his consonants and had the slightly limp wrist and a feet manner of one who modeled himself on a Bloomsbury original. For a man once seen as a champion of Delhi's culture, a bulwark of Eastern civilization against the seepage of Western influence, Ahmed Ali now cut an unexpectedly English figure with his clipped accent and tweed jacket and old leather elbow patches. He could have passed off successfully as a clubland character from a Noel, Plower, a Noel Coward play. But despite his comfortable, well-to-do appearance, Ahmed Ali was an angry man. Over the hours I spent with him, he spluttered and spat like a well-warmed frying pan. The first occasion was when I inadvertently mentioned that he was now a citizen of Pakistan. Poppycock, balderdash, he said. I was always against Jinnah. Never had any interest in Pakistan. Steady on, said Shanul Haq, his friend. The devil, said Ali. Pakistan's not a country, never was. It's a damned hodgepodge. It's not your country or my country. He was shouting at Shanul Haq now. It's a country of a damned bunch of feudal lords, robbers, bloody murderers, kidnappers. The outburst spluttered out into silence. But, I ventured, didn't you opt for Pakistan? Surely you could have stayed in Delhi had you wanted to. There was another explosion. I opted for Pakistan, I did not. I was the visiting professor in Nanking when the blasted partition took place. The bloody swine of Hindus wouldn't let me go back so home, so what do you mean? I went and saw the Indian ambassador in Peking bloody, bloody swine said I couldn't return, said it was a question of Hindu against Muslim, and there was nothing he could do. I was caught in China and had nowhere to go. Careful, said Shanul Haq, seeing the state his friend had worked himself up into. So how did you end up in Karachi, I asked. When my salary in Nanking was stopped, I found my way to some friends in Hong Kong. They put me on an amphibious plane to Karachi. Where else could I have gone if I couldn't go back to Delhi? Ali had now ceased to quiver with rage and was now merely very cross. I never opted for Pakistan, he said, gradually regaining his poise. The civilization I belong to, the civilization of Delhi, came into being through the mingling of two very different cultures, Hindu and Muslim. That civilization flourished for 1,000 years undisturbed until certain people came along and denied that that great mingling had taken place. Views like this can hardly have made you popular here, I said. They never accepted me in Pakistan, damn it. I've been weeded out. They don't publish my books. They have deleted my name. When copies of Twilight in Delhi arrived at the Karachi customs from India, they sent them back, said the book was about the forbidden city across the border, and they implied that the culture was foreign and subversive. Ah! In that case, I said, can't you go back to Delhi? Even now, can't you reapply for Indian citizenship? Now, no country is my country, said Ali. Delhi is dead. The city I knew, the language, the culture, everything is finished for me. It's true, said Shanul Haq. I went back 13 years after partition. Already everything was different. The hotel I stayed in, the ambassador, which I only later realized had been built on top of a graveyard where several of my friends were buried. In my mahalla, everyone used to know me. But suddenly, I was a stranger. My haveli was split into 10 parts and occupied by Punjabis. My wife's house had become a temple. Delhi was no longer the abode of the Delhi Walla. Even the walls had changed. It was very depressing. 
Before partition, said Ali, it was a unique city. Although it was already very poor, still it preserved its high culture. That high culture filtered down to the streets. Everyone was part of it. Even the milkman could quote Mir and Dag. The prostitutes would sing Persian songs and recite Hafiz. They may not have been able to read and write, but they had remembered the poets. And the language, said Shah Nul Haq. Every mahalla had its own expressions. The language used by the ladies was quite distinct from that used by the men. Now the language has shrunk. So many words are lost. We talked for an hour of the Delhi of their childhood and youth. We talked of the eunuchs and the Sufis and the pigeons and the poets, of monsoon picnics in Meroli and the jinn who fell in love with Ahmed Ali's aunt. We talked of the sweetmeat shops which stayed open until three in the morning, and sorcerers who could cast spells over a whole mahalla the possessed women who used to run vertically up the Zanana walls, and the miraculous cures affected by Hakim Ajmal Khan. The two old men swam together through great oceans of nostalgia before finally coming ashore on a strand of melancholy. But all of that is no more, said Ali. All that made Delhi special has been uprooted and dispersed. Now it is a carcass without a soul, said Shanul Haq. I am a fossil, said Ali, and Shanul Haq is on his way to becoming a fossil. But nevertheless, I insisted, if you both love Delhi so much, wouldn't you like to see it just one more time? I will never see that town again, said Ali. Once I was invited to give some lectures in Australia. There was some mechanical fault and the plane was diverted to Delhi. The plane landed, but I refused to get out. I said, I'm not getting out. I don't have to. You call your damn chairman. I'm not putting one foot on that soil which was sacred to me and which now has been desecrated. They got the entire staff of the airport to get me out, but I didn't move. How could I? How could I revisit that which once was mine? and which now was no longer mine. When they asked why I was behaving as I was, I simply sat in my seat and quoted Mir Taki Mir at them. What matters it, O oh breeze, if now has come the spring? When I have lost them both, the garden and my nest. What happened, I asked. The swine were all Punjabi, said Ali. Tell you the truth, I don't think they understood a bloody word I said. Krishnava, since you're outnumbered by three Delhi Wallers, um, do you feel yourself as an ambassador for uh, Calcutta? And if so, why have you moved to Delhi? I, I, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm always scared when I'm outnumbered by Delhiites. You might bring out your hockey sticks at any moment. Um, I, uh, yeah, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I have lived in Delhi reluctantly from time to time. I mean, I'm mostly living in Kerala right now. Pleasure. Can you hear me? Is it good? Yeah, I, I have a very difficult time in Delhi. I have a very difficult time. I, uh, I was listening to you g uh, read that section, and uh, I was thinking that the Delhi that he describes is the Calcutta that I know. You know, was, Yesterday we were on a panel, and there was a gentleman who was uh, discussing Machu Picchu. Right? And he was talking about the slaves who had built Machu Picchu. And somebody asked a question, what can we learn from these dead cities? And I was thinking of Sahir Lulianvi seeing the Taj Mahal and saying, when I see the Taj Mahal, I don't see a monument of love, but the blood of a thousand martyrs. I learned that line, which I cannot repeat in Urdu, because in Urdu is not good enough, but I learned that line from a man who was a peon at the Statesman, right? Not from a great professor uh, at a university or a, or a famous poet, but a man whose job it was to pick up pieces of paper from one office and drop them off at another office. Because that was the culture of the city, that is the culture of the city to this day, that it's not you know, poetry is not a specialized uh, profession. It's for all human beings. You describe in your book going to an adda, going to a, a poetry gathering. 
Yeah, I write about these guys who are never going to become famous poets. But they meet every Wednesday uh, in this little room without any windows in College Street. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they recite poetry, they share poetry, they run little magazines. They're still, uh, you know, um, they're, uh, according to the, the guy in, uh, in College Street who runs a little magazine library, still over 600 little magazines that are run uh, in, in Calcutta and the surrounding areas, right? Um, and uh, there's still, you know, hundreds of these sort of little groups of uh, these addas of poets and writers of different genres, you know, children's literature, you know, um, crime fiction, poetry. I met a guy who was a policeman who wrote nursery rhymes, you know, this thing. I mean, all sorts of interesting people who gather there. And the point is that none of them is ever going to get a book contract or become famous. Uh, but, you know, in the sort of the grind of daily life, they are heroes in a sense because they have refused to become these sort of these diminished machines who just go to work, come home, raise a family, watch television, go to work, come home. They have retained a part of themselves, that adolescent self, that, that has some other aspiration. No matter what job they do, whether they work in a government office or homeopaths or are teachers, they've retained a part of themselves that is still that 16-year-old who can fall in love, who can imagine, you know, and is still a poet. And do you feel that culture is still vibrant? I mean, is it, is it diminishing year by year? Will it die out? Is there a new cu cultureless Calcutta rising up? I hope not. I don't think it's going to die out. I think it's, uh, people, people way overestimate, you know, the kind of change. I think it's deep in people's bones. I think it's, you know, and, and it has to do with the architecture of the city. I think the city has not physically changed that dramatically, you know? And so to live in the city is to live in very kind of culturally soaked spaces. You can't be a very neutral person if you... Uh, are, are raised in Calcutta. But you describe very beautifully in your book the sensation that Calcutta was becoming an old folks home, that all the kids were emigrating, going either to Delhi or to Stanford or Harvard, or becoming great successes anywhere else, but st stagnating if they stayed at home in Calcutta. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that was particularly bad when I, when I first moved back, I think in the early 2000s, when, you know, the job situation was really bad. Middle class job situation. Calcutta has always had, is a place where if you are starving, you can come to Calcutta and find some kind of manual labor to do and, and, not, and survive. And that, I think, has been consistent. But for middle class people who had a, a, a college education, uh, it was a very difficult place to be in the late 90s, early 2000s. I think it's improved, actually, a lot. I think in the last 10, 15 years, it's improved a lot. At the end of the day, you know, cities are places where people need to have some form of employment, you know, and so... You, you described a death in the book. Um, yeah. and, and, ev and everyone was, the, the grandchildren were summoned from 15 cities. Or, yeah, 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 they're all over my cousins. My mother's side, none of my cousins are in Calcutta now. They're all over the world. Um, some of them are in Delhi, some of them are in London, some of them are U in the U.S. Yeah, and I think Dubai. that's... Dubai. Dubai, yeah, yeah. Fact, yeah, all over the place. And, you know, all right, sorry, I gesticulate a lot. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. On my, I mean... And there are a lot of families like that. If you go to particular neighborhoods in Calcutta, if you go to Salt Lake, you feel like you're in a, in a kind of, you know, uh, in a mortuary. You know, every house is gigantic. It's like, it's like being in, a, a, you know, these, uh, what is it, in, in uh, Buenos Aires, there's this famous uh, cemetery which has, every, everybody has a catacomb, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, these like small houses of the dead. Uh, you know, people with these big houses with like two people who are waiting to die, right? And when they die, then their relatives, their sons and daughters will come, you know, on planes and sort of, you know, attend to the funeral. But that's, you know, I think very specific neighborhoods of the city. I, I still think that, you know, community life is still very much, you know, uh, alive. And I know a lot of people, I mean, even friends of mine or relatives, even on my father's side, a lot of my cousins have moved back to the city. Even if you take a pay cut, it's worth it. And yet its ranking in the scale of Indian cities has diminished. I noticed on NDTV now that um, they put Hyderabad, but not Calcutta, as one of the cities where they, they, they show you the weather for. <laughs> is that fair or not? That, what, do you well, what is the basis of the... That's the thing that I always want to know. Like, what's the, what's the basis of, you know... Keep it up, keep it up. Oh, I know. I was just like, what is the basis of the thing? You know, it's very interesting. When, when I wrote the book, right, the book is about, you know, Calcutta in the present. But people would often say to me in a positive way that it's a nostalgic book. I was talking about this yesterday. And I say, I'm not writing a history. I mean, I'm not Ahmed Ali, you know, writing about a city that is gone. I'm writing about a city that I, you know, uh, have seen with my own eyes, reporting and, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, and, and what I realize is what they mean is that in their imagination, this kind of a city it belongs in the past. This is not an Indian city 
of the present. So their imagination of the country has no space for a city like this. But I think that that's a very uh, feeble and myopic imagination. You know, uh, the city of Rio used to think that uh, samba was a very low-class slum activity. You know, New Orleans used to think that jazz was something that uneducated, uncultured ex-slaves used to do. And I think that in that sense, tango in Argentina was, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, these cities always disown the, the, the greatest parts of themselves until somebody came along, you know. Um, this is just a quote by Roberto Arlt, who was a, uh, a writer, a contemporary of Borges. Borges, to his credit, uh, uh, always wrote about tango in very glowing terms, even though he was a uh, very literary figure. And this is a quote uh, by Roberto Arlt, who was a writer uh, and a journalist in, in Buenos Aires at the same time as, as Borges. He wrote, He llegado a la conclusión de que aquel no lo que no encuentra todo el universo encerrado en las calles de su ciudad no encontrará una calle original en ninguna de las ciudades del mundo y no las encontrará porque el ciego en Buenos Aires es ciego en Madrid o Calcuta. And, the, and in English? And in English, it's called the essay is called El placer de vagabundear, which you could probably make out as the pleasure of vagabonding. And in English. It is, I have come to the conclusion that he who does not encounter the whole universe in the streets of a city will not encounter an original street in any of the cities of the whole world. He won't encounter them because those who are blind in Buenos Aires are blind in Madrid or in Calcutta. <laughs> Sam, uh, Delhi was a city which, for all your ambiguity, was a city that you loved. But last year, you wrote something that amounted almost to an obituary for the city. Was it, was it a, fair, a fair obituary, or do you, do you regret it? Do you think it's right? I don't think you read the second half of the obituary. Um, it did. It knocked it right down, but I think it tried to pull it up again. Um, what happened is I left in 2014. Uh, my father was ill and then died, and I left Delhi. Uh, I then returned uh, at the end of 2016, the longest gap I'd been away from Delhi since I'd first come in the late 80s. Uh, and I arrived one night, uh, late November 16. Uh, it was, I think, day two or day three of demonetization. Uh, there were all these Japanese tourists wandering around the airport, unable to get any money out unable to go anywhere. I managed to get some money from somewhere, but couldn't get it changed. These were small things. I later discovered there was a wonderful man who had changed your 2,000 rupee notes into 1,900 rupee notes. Uh, I learned that later. Anyway, I, I drove into the city. It was disgustingly polluted in a way that I had never found in that city. Uh, and to my bemusement, because I hadn't quite taken on board how the situation had changed, there were long, snaking queues of people covered in shawls in the fog, queuing for their own money outside banks. Docile, cowed. I then went up to the flat I was staying in, and a fourth floor flat, I got into bed, and then there was an earthquake. Uh, it wasn't a very serious earthquake, but it was an earthquake. So that's what I wrote about. Uh, after a week or two, things got a lot better. Uh, and I've just been back again, uh, and it's not as bad as all that, but it's still pretty bad. And the pollution issues are very, very serious. They are shortening people's lives. They are killing people, and that needs to be addressed. I would find it really hard to live there, and I have the choice. Uh, I think it's really quite appalling. Um, Delhi, I still love Delhi, but I'm afraid I am nostalgic about a brief golden period that lasted, in my view, and I may well be wrong on this, from about 2006 or seven, let's say seven, because that's 150 years after the mutiny, to uh, 
let's say, 2012, 2013. I thought it was a wonderful place then, really exciting. Uh, it's not what it was. Pilar, you, you've examined uh, Delhi uh, through uh, a, a more academic lens. Do you see it as a city which, which is flourishing or one which is in decline? I mean, obviously it's growing and apparently f seen from space. If you ignore the boundaries of Haryana and, and Delhi State and UP and so on, it, it's, it, but just look at the urban area. It's the second largest urban area in the world, 26 million people. Only Greater Tokyo is larger. So is that a sign of success, or are we, are we on the edge of a kind of uh, a future Detroit? Will it be a dust belt? Will it be like Fatipal Sikri? <laughs> uh, I think that Delhi um, sort of is growing a lot, but somehow the pattern of a city of cities that has I mean, Delhi is taking with it from, from the beginning. It's sort of continuing. One sees Gurgaon, um, Ghaziabad, and Noida. All of these sort of cities are sort of coming together. So the city is sort of continuing its <coughs> tradition of developing as a city of cities. That's precisely the reason why I have sort of written about cultural exchange, because I can see this issue with contemporary architects that very often they are not aware about their history or about which kind of models they're referring to. So very often, one sort of use aspirational values and get inspired, let's say, by Western architects or sort of in a globalized context. Architects sort of picks architecture from all over the world without looking into their context properly. So I think these problems of pollution, of traffic, of many issues of contemporary daily and this, let's say, sort of glass and steel architecture, sort of similar everywhere, sort of comes from inside schools of architecture, this unawareness of cultural exchanges and how this affects architecture and how many mistakes done nowadays are there because Architects are not aware of their past, are not looking into their context, their topographical sort of um, soil. And there's very much, there's not enough deep understanding of what is the local condition and the context to be able then to address the problems. And very often, for example, with the master plans, or the, the, it is a top-down sort of planning and designing and not a bottom-up planning. So I think architects, if they'll be able to twist, the few, few of them will actually do this, but very few. I think it should, it should be much more. Many architects should actually start planning and designing bottom-up because many, many problems will be addressed much better. So I think if this part will be sort of addressed, Delhi could really flourish and I mean, it can go in the right direction. So I think a small group of people are actually doing it, but there's too few still. More optimistic note. <laughs> we have time for a few questions. We've five minutes to go. This gentleman had his hand straight up here. You, sir, yes. Um, good afternoon. My question is for William, Sam, and Pila. Um, I know you guys have written extensively on Delhi and uh, you spoke about the aggression, the underlying aggression that is almost a characteristic of the city and someone who comes to the city for the first time, uh, it's very apparent to. For people who live in Delhi, we've almost internalized and normalized that to a great extent. Uh, but to what do you attribute this underlying aggression in the city? Is it just uh, the pre-independent, uh, the post-independence uh, phenomena like Rana Das Gupta in a session over here about four years back? had uh, described Delhi as a traumatized city, as almost a city of, uh, of trauma. What's the cause of, of this underlying aggression in the city, according to you guys? Sam, what's the cause of Delhi's trauma? Mm. I, do, I don't have a clear-cut answer to that. I mean, there are obvious answers, but they're not ones which I can directly relate to them. There have been terrible ancient and modern and in-between moments in Delhi's history. Uh, I think particularly of the Sikh riots and to a degree on a smaller level anti-Muslim riots um, more recently uh, that have never been dealt with. Uh, that goes back much further. Whether I can really draw a direct link between those and what you describe as a mood of aggression, I, I really don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask that. But it does stand out. I think what's odd is when you're living there all the time, I'm a, it does become normalized. And you have to go away and come back to see it again. 
because for me it's not only the aggression that's critical to understanding Delhi, it's the docility. It's actually that people don't stand up as a group, particularly the poor, when things go wrong. They'll have an argument among themselves in the street where they'll try and kill each other, but on bigger, wider issues, there's just an acceptance, oh, life is like this. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, should I say something? The, the, the um, I mean, Rana's, Rana's solution was, I mean, he, he believed it was all to do with partition. Um, but I think, looking, when I, the more I read about Delhi, I'm writing about Delhi in the 18th century at the moment, and you have this, these references there to people coming from elsewhere, from India, and finding the, particularly the Gujars around Delhi, the Miwatis, as, as super aggressive and predatory in a way that, that they were not used to from other parts of India. So I think there is something in the soil, and, and I think Delhi has a history of trauma. I mean, you know, first Muhammad took a look at what the British did in, in, in 1857 to 8, clearing the entire city out. But you have a, you have a lovely reference to uh, a different sort of uh, fight that you can get into in the streets in Calcutta about asking directions. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I was say, I totally agree with Sam's point. That I remember <laughs> seeing... Thanks, sorry. The, I remember the first time I ever saw people fighting in Delhi, it was two, two guys had an accident. It was like a scooter and a cycle. And these two guys had an accident. And then they start fighting in the middle of the street. And everybody just passes them by as if nothing abnormal is happening. And I was like, what the hell is this? Because if this happened in Calcutta, there would be an entire community around that, adjudicating, you know, and determining justice, meeting out justice, for better and for worse, you know, that would become a collective social concern. Um, and that, the fact that it will become that is what keeps the guys who have all the power on the road, meaning the, the guys with the biggest cars, from running over the guys who are smaller than them. That's why it doesn't become a Darwinian jungle, because you might have the biggest car, but if you run over somebody on a bicycle, you will be lynched, right? Um, I mean, it tells you, to me, it, it was very revealing of a society, actually, you know. Um, I was, yes, I just, there's a little Wonderful thing. passage. I, the, 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 particularly the opening chapter of this book is, is an absolute classic of writing about cities. This passage is a favorite. Um, so, uh, to me, Delhi is not so much uh, a city as an agglomeration of enclaves, as many of its gated not, uh, neighborhoods are literally called. Its rich residents turn inward into the privacy of their own atomized lives. Its poor are largely shunted out of sight. Stop and ask for directions in Delhi, and no one knows, because no one is truly of the city. Ask for directions on any Calcutta street corner, and a half dozen mustached men will appear out of nowhere, <laughs> determined to direct you somewhere. Uh, they may offer radically divergent views on the matter. A street fight might break out as a result. Rival political camps may emerge, and traffic may be barricaded for the rest of the afternoon. But it is their city, their streets, their neighborhoods. I think that is a real distinction. I think uh, there's very... <laughs> Calcutta is the city of, of Bengalis. It is the city of Bengalis, while Delhi is no longer the city of Delhi Wallers, nor even is it anymore the city of the Punjabis. Uh, it is now the first city in India, which is properly cosmopolitan, for better or worse. And you're as likely to find a Bengali, a Tamil, a Malu uh, as your neighbors, uh, as, as you are to find someone whose grandfather was there uh, or, or, or who arrived in 47. We're out of time, guys, um, but we will be signing books. So if you have any more questions, do come uh, round the corner to the signing cabin, and we will see you there. Thank you. Thank you.